In this video, we'll learn about high-performance binding features of the RAD Grid View Control for Windows Forms. We'll see how to use virtual mode of the RAD Grid View, how to manage our own data cache and handle virtual mode events, and we'll learn to apply these methods for large data sets and for fast refreshing data. Starting with just a blank Windows Forms project here, first thing we're going to do is extend the size of our form so we have more room for our grid. And then we're going to drop a rad grid view control onto the form. Now we're going to use the smart tag of the grid view control to add a data source to our project. This is going to be a database data source and it's going to use the AdventureWorks database. The table that we're going to use is the sales order header table, just a few fields from this table. The sales order ID, order date, purchase order, and account number, and some of the values here, subtotal, tax, freight, and total due. So that gives us eight fields we're going to use from this table. Now you can see that that added a data set a binding source and a table adapter to our project which is very convenient but we don't want to leave the rad grid view bound to that data source because in virtual mode we're going to be leaving the grid in unbound mode which means we're going to handle all of the rows and columns and the data management tasks ourselves now I'm going to dock the grid here to the top just so it looks a little bit nicer. Let's go to the form load event of the form which we can get to by double clicking the form itself and you can see that Visual Studio has added a line of code which fills the table adapter with data from our data set. We're not going to move that, we're just going to leave it there but we can get rid of this comment line here. Now since we're working in virtual mode, we're going to have to add some properties that will help us tell the RAD grid view how many rows and how many columns it has. So we're going to add a number of rows property, which in this case we're going to use 50, and number of columns, which we already know is going to be 8. Now one more thing we need is some sort of cache to hold the data that we're going to tie to the RAD grid view. In this case, I'm going to use a list of lists, which is basically a table of strings, and we're going to call it order table, and that's just fine. Now we're using a list to bind to because RAD Grid View binds very well to lists. It also binds to binding lists, to custom business objects, and of course to data sets and tables. But in this case we're just going to use a simple list. Now there's some setup code which I'm going to paste in here. And this is simply setting a bunch of properties on the RAD Grid View. We're turning off a lot of the advanced features of the grid just to simplify our example. We're not going to allow the user to add or delete or edit or sort or filter any of the data in our grid view. And finally, we're going to initialize our table. This is just filling all of the columns in a row and then filling all of the rows with some blank data. Now if you did want to allow the user to use some of these advanced features, you would just have to account for that later on in your code for virtual mode. Now to actually set the grid up for virtual mode, we're going to add some code to that load event handler. First of all, we're going to set the virtual mode property of the grid to true. And as we already know, we have to tell the grid explicitly how many columns and how many rows it has because we're handling all of that data management ourselves. So we set the column count 
and the row count. And also in virtual mode, we have to handle some of the events that are going to be triggered when the grid view refreshes its data. Since we're using a read-only grid, we're just going to have to handle this cell value needed event. Now if you were allowing the user to edit data, you would also need to handle the cell value pushed event. So we'll just add an event handler to the cell value needed and we'll let Visual Studio insert that event handler for us. You can see that right away it's filled with a throw exception line here which we're just going to leave for now until we get some more work done. So let's add another property to our form here. And since we're using our grid to display order headers in a certain month, we're going to use a date time variable to store the date of the data that we're currently looking at. And in our load event, we're going to add some setup code, which I'm going to paste in here, which is going to initially sort our data in the data set by the date and also set that current date variable to the first day of the first month of the first record in our data set. Also, when you're using unbound mode for the RAD grid view control, None of your columns are going to have those nice automatically generated headers. So we're going to have to set our own header text for each one of the columns. And here I've just set each one to a string which represents the data that we're going to see in each field. So we have our grid view all set up and we have our data cache which is our table. The only thing we have left to do is actually fill the table with data. And in order to do that, you're going to have to add some sort of custom method which handles the filling of data into that table. So we're going to add a method called get new data. And inside this method, I'm going to paste some code which is going to handle grabbing some data from the data set which is all of the records with order dates inside a certain month. So I've created a filter string which is going to return all of the records whose order date is greater than the first day of the current month and less than the first day of the next month. And we're going to return an array of data rows based on that filter and ordered according to the total due amount. Now this means that the 50 records we display will be the 50 records with the highest total due amount. Now we want to make sure that we only populate our table if there actually was data returned so we're going to check to see that the length of our returned array was not equal to zero. And later on we're going to add some code here, but for now we're just going to leave that conditional blank. And if there was data, then this is where we actually fill our table, which is our data cache for the RAD grid view. And here I'm pasting some pretty simple code which just either fills the table to the full number of rows or to the number of rows that were returned, whichever is smaller, and fills each column of each row with the correct data. And some of it I've added a format string here which is just going to make it look a little bit nicer. So the final thing we want to do is we want to notify the grid 
that new data has been received. So to do that, we're going to call the update method of the grid element inside the rad grid view control and we're going to pass it a notify action which in this case is going to be batch data changed which tells the grid that all of the data has been changed and it needs to update all of its cells. Now all we have left is to finish out this cell value needed handler which we're going to get rid of this exception here and we're going to return the corresponding cell value from our order table. Now we know that since we're not allowing the user to change the order of the columns or the order of the rows, we know that we can just return exactly the row and column index that the event args are requesting. At the end of the load event, we want to get new data. So let's add a call to our get new data method. So let's run this project and take a look at the form here that we've created. And we can see that it's loading the top 50 order headers for the month of July of 2001. Well, that's not very exciting. So we're going to add some more functionality, which is going to demonstrate some of the benefits of using this virtual mode. So let's return to our designer. We're going to add some buttons to our form, which will add some functionality that will allow the user to sort of page through the different months or to hold down a button and scroll through multiple months. So we're going to add some buttons to both sides here. And then we're going to change the text of our buttons. Uh, that one is going to be the previous month button. And Button 2 is going to be next month. And button 3 will be our scrolling button for previous month. And button 4 will be the scrolling button for next month. There we go. Now for the scrolling, we're also going to need a timer which will control the updating of the data while the button is held down. So let's add some event handlers for our new controls. We want to add a handler for the previous month and next month. And we also want to add a handler for our scroll buttons but not on the click event this is going to be on the mouse down event of both scrolling buttons and then we want to add a handler for the mouse up event so that when the button is released the scrolling stops we can actually use the same event handler for both of those. And finally, we need a handler for the tick event of our timer. So to implement our scrolling, we're going to need to add one last property to our form, which is going to hold a value that tells us which direction we're scrolling in. So we're going to call that move forward, it's going to be a boolean. And if it's true, then we're going to scroll forward. And if it's false, we're going to scroll backward. And let's add in that little bit of code to reset the month if we are scrolling and there's no data returned. 
and now we're ready to finish out those event handlers. So button one was previous. So for previous, we want to subtract a month from the current date. So that's the same as adding a negative month. And we want to call our get new data method. Button two was next. So the only difference is that we're going to add a positive month. Button three was our scrolling for previous. So in that case, we're going to set our move forward variable to false and we're going to start the timer. Button four was scrolling next. So move forward is going to be true. And again, we want to start the timer. Now for the mouse up event, all we're going to do is stop the timer. And that's the same for both buttons. So finally, on our timer tick event, I'm going to paste in some code. And all this code does is, if we're moving forward, it adds a month to the current date on each timer tick, and otherwise subtracts a month on each timer tick, and then gets new data. And we don't want to forget to set our directions for our button clicks up here as well. So button one was previous, so move forward is false, and button two was next, so move forward is true. So now we're ready to run our project, and now we can see the operation of our buttons. Our paging buttons let us move from month to month, forwards and backwards, and our scrolling buttons scroll through the months very quickly. And that's because the 50 records that we see are the only 50 records that are being managed. Now this actual table has over 30,000 records, so you can imagine that performance is quite improved by only using the 50 records that we're viewing. So this is how using virtual moat can really help you get the maximum performance out of your RAD grid view and also to apply your own custom data management operations to the grid. For more information on the RAD grid view control or any of the Telerik controls, click on the links above. And thanks for watching.